Should we fear the Earth people, leader? Space commandos, Gorb, should fear no people. Our galaxy depends on us for a successful mission. Yeah, I forgot. What is our mission? Space Lump, we are to steal the master plan for Earth's most important language. A tough job. Think of it. Making off with the master plan for English grammar. But later, why? We've learned many English words watching Earth radio and television. What more do we need to know? We lost our old language and turned to English. But our communications are incomplete and confused. Because of poor communication, our satellites collide with comets and asteroids, and our messages result in lost spaceships. How will learning the grammar master plan help our communication, leader? If you want to fix something, you have to know how it works, don't you? If a spaceship needs repairing, you need the plans, don't you? Our English isn't working, so we're going after the plans. When we understand how the language is built, we'll be able to solve our communications problems. We've heard every word on that alien ship. The orbit audio monitor has done a fine job, General. Thank goodness the aliens mean no harm. I don't trust them, Miss President. Let me blast them. No, General. We're going to help them. Dr. Langley here from the Language Lab can give them everything they need. Right, Langley? Yes, Miss President. And of course, they'll find there is no real master plan for English grammar. We have names that we've given to different kinds of words according to the different kinds of work they do. And we have names for the different parts of a sentence. Oh, it's that simple. Yes, the names help anyone understand how the language works. And those space people shouldn't have any trouble. My best agents, Gus and Emily, are making contact with them right now. Splendid, Langley. Splendid. You say we do not have to find the master plan. That all we have to do is learn some names for the kind of work words do? That's all. And you're telling me that you want to help us? Isn't that wonderful? It's terrible. You want to spoil all our adventure and excitement? Who can enjoy a secret mission without sneaking around and spying and getting away with something? Besides, you're trying to fool us. I don't believe you. There has to be a master plan. It's not that hard, sir. It's really rather simple. You see, the basic unit in our language is a group of words that tell the complete thought. We call it a sentence. And each sentence has... Stop! Now, get them out of here. We'll find the English master plan by ourselves. It wouldn't hurt to start out with what they said about a sentence. You're right. Enter it in the memory. Search teams, prepare for Earth landings. We'll make some sentences and then analyze them. That will lead us to the master plan. That's right, Ms. President. They insist that there has to be a master plan. They have refused our help, and they are going to try and figure out English grammar on their own. And we have a plan to help them with that. We are grammar programming one of the new robots, and we'll make sure they capture it. Looks like you got great stuff, men. That's not all. We've got more here. All right. Begin analysis mode. There appears to be two distinctly different categories here. I've got it by blast off. The part marked in green tells what the sentence is about, and the part marked in orange tells what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if this is the key to the whole master plan. I don't know, but we'll sure find out. That looks like one. I think so too. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. Those words seem to form a sentence. They certainly do. And how, sir, does one make these sentences? 
Is it quite difficult? Oh, no, it's quite easy. All you really need is a noun like this to tell what the sentence is about. And one of these words to tell what happened, or has happened, or could happen, or will happen. A noun and a verb, eh? Wait till the leader hears this. Hold it right there, robot. You are a prisoner of the planet Thor. I guess you got me. G and GC Robot Ralph. Your prisoner, sir. G and GC? Grammar and good communication, sir. The perfect prisoner. We may get a medal. I'll try and help. We'd like that, Ralph. Say, if Earth people are anything like their robots, they're friendly and understand their language, too. Oh, Earth people are friendly, but they don't know their language like I do. I'm a grammar expert. He'll know. That's right, he will. Listen, we found out that a sentence has two parts, but what should we call them? Oh, that's easy. The part that tells who or what the sentence is about is called the subject. And the part of the sentence that tells what happens is called the predicate, like this. Subject and predicate. The blocker. Wait till the chief gets this. There you are, chief. These that name a person, a place, or a thing are called nouns. And these that tell the action are called verbs. Great work, men. Nouns and verbs. Another step toward the master plan. Wait till you see what we have, Chief. We, uh, Chief! Where did you get those names? What's this noun and verb? This part that tells the main thing the sentence is about is called the subject. And this part that tells what happens is the predicate. How's that again? Team one said that these are nouns and these are verbs. What's going on here? We got our information from a great expert. This is grammar expert first class robot Ralph. But team one said... Do not be alarmed, Commander. Both of them are right. Both are right? Both are right. What are you trying to do? Confuse us? Why isn't one name enough? It does seem confusing at first, but it's easy to explain. I'll show you. We take a noun and a verb, and we make a sentence that tells a complete thought. Waldo kicks. If all we ever wrote were little short sentences like this, we wouldn't need any names for the parts of the sentence. The names noun and verb would do fine. But sometimes we use more words and make a sentence with more detail. Waldo kicks the ball through the window. This sentence has three nouns. So the word noun alone can no longer tell us the one main thing this sentence is about. The subject of this sentence is Waldo. Though the sentence also tells us about two other things, ball and window, the sentence is mainly about Waldo. Waldo is the subject. Hey, that's a good idea. And that must be why the word predicate is used for the part of the sentence that tells what happens. That's right. Verb is the name of a kind of word that tells action. Predicate is the name for the part of the sentence that tells the main action. We're on the stellar star stream now, men. This must be the cornerstone. Now that we're this far, nothing can stop us. We'll get that master plan. They're doing very well. They've learned everything on this board. It's lucky we managed to have them capture Ralph. They even learned predicate. A lot of people don't like to learn predicate. It sounds so, so technical. It's not so bad. Predicate, 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 see? I guess that's the word everybody has always used. But I wish they would think of a new one. You aren't the only one. 
Look at what some people say. Some people call the subject the noun phrase and the predicate verb phrase. Do you like that better? Gee, I don't know. Well, it doesn't make any difference to me. They mean the same thing. The space people didn't have any trouble with predicate or anything. I wonder how they'll do when they come across some big sentences. Great galloping galaxy. Look at this sentence Moogle has just put up on the analyzer. A noisy green frog down in the pond near my house croaks on a floating lily pad. Look at those nouns. Look at all those other words we don't even know the names of. How are we supposed to find the subject and the predicate in a big sentence like that? Gee, leader, I think it's too hard. I think it's hard, too. But we can't just quit the first time something looks a little complicated. Besides, Ralph's going to help us, isn't he? Of course. Do not be frightened by many words. All sentences have only two main parts. One that tells the main thing the sentence is about. One that tells what happens. What is this sentence about? It is about a frog. What happens? He croaks. Frog is the simple subject. Croak is the simple predicate. But what about all those other words? What are their names? What are they doing? There is no need to learn more names right now. However, notice that all words in the sentence give detail about either the subject or the predicate. Gee, Ralph, big as it is, this sentence seems to have only two big parts, a great big subject and a great big predicate. Very observant. Frog and all the words that tell about the simple subject frog, we may call the complete subject. Croak and all the words that tell about the action of the simple predicate, croak, we may call the complete predicate. Someday I want to learn the names of the jobs those other words are doing. Then, remember, all words work for either the subject or the predicate. This will help you as you learn more about the work words do. Haven't we learned enough, leader? I'd like to be sure of this before we learn more. You're right. I think we have the basic English master plan. But I want to be sure every one of us knows it before we go back to Zorf. I know. Let's have a school. I have a better idea. We'll make a training course, just like the Earth Marines, with obstacles and firing ranges, and every commando has to pass before we go home. Great idea, leader. The moon that orbits this planet would be a good place to use. Starburger, you take charge of setting it up and have Ralph help you. All right, commandos. This course winds up part one of our communications mission. When it's your turn on the firing line, take a hard look at the sentence and aim at the target I call. Monsters eat people. Target, nouns. Good hit, right on target. Same sentence, target two, subject. Think, Commando. Ask yourself, who eats? On target. Next. All the stars twinkle. Target, verb. On target. How are they doing, Sergeant? I'm sure we'll pass them all if they handle the next one. Two bold explorers destroyed seven monsters on the planet. Target one, nouns. On target. Target two, subject of the sentence. I'm not sure. Here's a hint to remember. When you're in doubt about which noun is the subject, first look for the action, then ask, who did it? So show me the verb. Now ask, who destroyed? Now, can you hit your target? That makes it 100%. Target 
sir. Good work, Commandos. We wouldn't have made it without you, Ralph. Welcome to the language lab, space leader. We are returning our prisoner, Robot Ralph. He has been very helpful. Are you ready to find subjects and predicates in the cold star streams of outer space? We are ready, Dr. Langley. Our secret mission is a complete success. So it doesn't have to be a secret any longer. Are you sure you can't stay around a bit longer? You've just finished this first board. We've got a lot more you could learn. We've got a great start. Noun, verb, subject, predicate. That's enough for this mission. And by stars, that's a lot. The message maker is ready with nouns that name persons, places, and things. It's ready with verbs that tell actions. Good. We must warn our planet Fork if danger appears. Stay alert. I do. Look, let's suppose I'm watching the scope. Suppose I see Nordian spaceships. I choose a noun and a verb forming a message that tells a complete thought. My message is ready for transmission to Zorbion headquarters. Not bad, eh? Pretty good. But I just realized something. What's that? Wouldn't headquarters want to know how many spaceships are coming? What kind of spaceships? Shouldn't he tell them details about when and where and how? We should. We should. But we can't. Our code kit has only nouns and verbs. By Zorf, you're right. We can name people, places, and things, and we can tell actions, but we can't tell any details with only nouns and verbs. Welcome, all of you, to the Marvin Company sales team. We've got a great new product for you to sell. Our market research shows that people want to describe things, that they want to tell details. Well, we've got the answer. Yes, sir. Marvin's Marvy Modifiers. And what is a modifier? Well, ma'am, a modifier is a word that tells more about another word. And who needs modifiers? Everybody. Sounds wonderful. Great product. Sign me up. And are we bringing out only one model? No, sir. Today, we are introducing the adjective to tell more about the well-known noun. And also, we are bringing out the adverb to give details about those lively action-telling verbs. What's more, to help you show people just how helpful modifiers can be, each of you will have one of these wonderful sales kits. Now, let's get out there and move those modifiers. <laughs> And how are you today, sir? Oh, that's wonderful. And how do I know that I am just the man you want to see? Because, sir, when you have only nouns and verbs, you are stuck. Yes, stuck in the mud. <laughs> what do you have to communicate details? Details like what kind and how many? Details like where, when, and how? Why, not a thing, sir. Not until you stock up with a good supply of modifiers. Yes, sir. I'm offering you the full line. Hundreds of adjectives to give detail to nouns. Countless adverbs to describe actions exactly. <laughs> adjectives? Adverbs? How come they have such funny names? Do I run the company? I didn't invent the name, but what's in a name? These little beauties do the job. I'm offering you the full line. We better get them before the Nordians attack. Then we'll really need to send a good message. We'll take them.
Zom Blaske. The Nordians are coming. It's a good thing we have those adjectives and adverbs. Now we can make messages that do the job. Sure. Now we can write with some detail. We can make this message a lot better. Right. First, we modify the noun spaceship with the adjective 20, large, armed. Now we add the adverb rapidly to tell how they are approaching. Good, good. We can improve the second sentence, too. Defenseless outer planets. Tells more. And we need another adverb quickly. Now it's clear and complete. Ready for transmission. Transmit. We've saved the galaxy. Attention, students. This planet, as you know, was an early Earth colony, and we are here to document the way they used adjectives and adverbs. Uh -huh. Before the photographers arrive, I want you to place a green bar under each adjective you find and a yellow one under each adverb. Uh -huh. Now, let's go. We will meet back here at the spaceship at 8 o'clock. Giant rocks suddenly fall. Giant is the adjective because it tells what kind of rock. Right. And suddenly is an adverb. It modifies fall. Suddenly fall, fall suddenly. Fall is the verb you know. Of course I know. Come on, let's find another. Fiery volcanoes erupt violently. Ah, let's find the adjective first. Let's see. Volcanoes is the noun. Fiery describes the volcano. It tells what kind of volcano. So, fiery is an adjective. I agree. Gee whiz, erupt. That must mean the same as explode. So, erupt would be an action word, a verb. So, that makes violently an adverb. It tells how the volcano erupts. Flying lizards flutter noisily. Boy, this must have been some place. Flying lizards? Wow! Come on, come on. Mark the adjective. And I'll mark the adverb. Flying is the adjective. And noisily is the adverb. Oh, here's a marvelous one. It's almost comical. <laughs> Scared dinosaurs scamper clumsily. Tell me which word is the adverb. Gee, I don't know. Do you know which word is the verb? Scamper is the verb. Oh, then clumsily is the adverb. Very good. Clumsily modifies the verb scamper. I know which word the adjective is. It's scared. Scared describes the dinosaur. Oh, very good, Felicia. <laughs> I hope everyone is doing as well. These adjectives and adverbs are important for good messages. But I bet they would help make better stories, too. I suppose they would. Sure they would. Suppose I wrote about my uncle who got shot down. He crashed on the desert. An adjective would make that more interesting. In fact, you could use a whole group of adjectives. He crashed on the hot, bare, trackless desert. You can almost feel the place. Hey, I'll bet we can do the same thing with adverbs, too. He struggled across the sand. Adverbs can tell how he struggled across the sand. That's much better. How about the burning sand? That's good, but that's an adjective. It modifies the noun sand. I know it. Adverbs with verbs and adjectives with nouns. Hold up, boss. You were right. Everyone needs them. Nobody turns me down. Got adjectives and adverbs all over the Western galaxy. <laughs> People are not only using them one at a time, they're using them in bunches. You thought that was good, did you? Wait till you see our newest line. Newest line? 
we've come out with a new modifier? That's right, Max. Take a look at these little beauties. Prepositional phrases, we call them. Prepositional phrases? That's right. Prepositional phrases. They look kind of interesting. You're darn tootin' they're interesting. They give a lot of information. Just look what you can do with them. They can be adjectives. The boy with the bat is frightened. The phrase, with the bat, is an adjective phrase that tells which boy. But this prepositional phrase acts as an adverb. The ball was hit through the window. Through the window tells where the ball was hit. A prepositional phrase like after the game or before the race is an adverbial phrase that tells when the action occurred. By these, that's terrific. Prepositional phrases, eh? Yeah. See these little words they start with? We call them prepositions. Kind of catchy, isn't it? Ha <laughs> ha. Catchy? Uh, sure, boss, catchy. Anyway, uh, they should sell like hotcakes, even if they are called prepositional phrases. They sure will. And look at this sales campaign we have lined up. An ace team of flyers to show what a prepositional phrase can say. We fly among the stars. We cruise between the planets. We hover behind the moon. We rocket past the sun. We zoom into the heavens. They're wonderful, Bob. Just as soon as you're back from vacation, I expect you to start setting new sales records. Right, boss. <laughs> and you out there, maybe it's time I did a little selling to you. Next time you write, remember my marvelous modifiers. Put in an adjective to go with that noun. Better yet, put two. Put an adverb alongside that verb. And with either one, a prepositional phrase really lets your readers know what's going on. Good writing. buying chisel sticks. We will soon have to send the workers home. The whole planet of Fargon is ruined. I have an idea, Mr. Fizzler. Everyone here on Fargon has learned to speak English by watching Earth TV. All the planets in this galaxy have learned English. So let's write books in English. That's nonsense, Far Out. There's not a written word of English on the planet Fargon. Ridiculous. We can send to Earth Language Lab for the written words we need. As Vice President, I protest this madness. Quiet, Deep Six. I think, I think we're saved. Wonderful idea, Far Out. I'm making you a partner in the business. From now on, it's Fizzler and Far Out. You choose his crackpot ideas over my brilliant schemes? You make him a partner? Far Out? That's too much. I quit. But I'll fix them. <laughs> they haven't heard the last of me. <laughs> Here is the poster for our language lab special, Dr. Langley. Special this month only. Ten boxes, nouns. To name persons, places, and things. 
Four boxes, adjectives. Descriptive words telling what kind and how many. Five boxes, verbs. To tell actions. Four boxes, adverbs. Descriptive words to tell details of where, when, and how. And one box, miscellaneous. Fabulous. We have just received an order from Fizzler and Far Out on the planet Fargon. Our special this month is just what they need. I will instruct the warehouse to assemble the order right away. You are doing very well for your first day, Waldo. How is the Fargon order coming? I have about half of it here, but I have a question. Why are there two kinds of mounds here? If I don't know the difference, will the Fargon people know? You can find out just like they will. Look inside the lid of the box. Common noun names a person, place, or thing. Also names qualities like kindness and ideas like freedom. I thought all nouns did that. How is a proper noun different? Look and see. Proper noun names a particular person, place, or thing. A proper noun always begins with a capital letter. Hmm, a particular person, place, or thing? Oh, I'll just compare some of these. Let's see. Dog is a common noun. But rover means a certain or particular dog. So, rover is a proper noun. City is a common noun, but New York is a proper noun. Girl, common noun. Maria, proper noun. You learn fast, Waldo, and that is good, because you have to have these boxes closed up in five minutes to be in time for the freighter to Omega Galaxy. <laughs> It wasn't hard at all to sneak into this space freighter. Now, I'll teach Fizzler and Far Out to shortchange me. Give him a burst with the stun gun. Then we'll grab the words and escape from the space coop. There's too many boxes to take on a space coop. You're right. Okay, we'll take the pronouns. They might not even miss them. Then, they'll get themselves in trouble. <laughs> Captain, Captain, we've been hijacked. They gave me a blast with the stun gun and stole two boxes. Uh, pronouns, I think. What shall we do, Captain? We'll deliver the words we have left. But I don't think we need to get the Fargon people all upset by telling them. We'll report the hijack to the Space Patrol. They might even recover the goods before they're missed. That's the lot of them. We have common nouns, proper nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and one box of miscellaneous. I thought there would be more. Some must be missing. Don't be silly. Let's get started. <laughs> Language Lab, Language Lab, this is Space Patrol Ship Comet. We need assistance to recover a shipment of pronouns. Recover pronouns? I don't understand. Several boxes of pronouns were reported hijacked from the space freighter Starload, en route to the planet Fargon. By Jupiter, what nerve! Please give me a brief description of what we're looking for. Certainly, Captain. Ralph, punch up personal pronouns and then possessive pronouns on the display unit, please. I'm going to show you some very common pronouns, Captain. These are personal pronouns, Captain, used in place of nouns. These are possessive pronouns. They are used to show that something belongs to someone. Thank you, Doctor. Now we'll get right after that hijacker. Good luck, Captain. Without pronouns, those fellows on Fargon will be doing some mighty strange writing. Ralph? I think we'll update your pronoun program and send you on a mission to Fargon. At last, 
far out, we're saved. Success and prosperity for far gone are right here in the pages of our books. The printing is nice, but there is something strange about the writing. As the creature wagged the creature's three tails, Vardok took off Vardok's cap and handed the princess the princess long-lost crown. Creature? Creature? Vardok took off Vardok's cap. Princess? Princess? Hey, same words over and over. But that's kind of strange. Strange? Oh, we won't have best sellers if the writing is strange. Let me see a page. Angrily, the evil Rustic growled. Rustic thinks Rustic's plan has failed Rustic. Rustic, Rustic, Rustic? It is strange. We're ruined again. Oh, what happened? I don't know what happened. I just don't know what's wrong. But I know what's wrong. The, who are you? Ralph Robot, from the language lab. Why are you here? Hey, what is going on around here? Your shipment of words arrived without any pronouns. The pronouns you need were hijacked. The space patrol is after a man named Deep Six. That scoundrel, he's ruined us. But why do we need pronouns? These sentences seem full enough already. Exactly. They are too full of nouns. So full of nouns, they are clumsy and sound funny. Clumsy and funny. We're ruined! What shall we do? I will show you. If the Space Patrol recovers your pronouns, you can replace one of the creatures, one Vardok, and one Princess with pronouns. In this sentence, you can replace one Rostic with the pronoun R, another with the pronoun my, and the third with the pronoun me. If these sentences used pronouns, they wouldn't sound so foolish. But we don't have any pronouns. Oh, Fargon is ruined. No, Mr. Fizzler, maybe not. Look, a space patrol cruiser. It must be bringing our pronouns. Most certainly, and I will stand by to assist you in placing them. We're saved. We'll show that deep six. Mr. Deep Six, you are found guilty of hijacking three types of pronouns, personal pronouns, which are used in place of nouns that name persons or things, possessive pronouns that show who things belong to, and relative pronouns that show relationships between things and people. Pronouns are important. This is a serious crime. However, as all the pronouns were recovered undamaged... Your Honor, only the personal and possessive pronouns were recovered. The relative pronouns were lost in space. Until more relative pronouns are manufactured, everyone will have to write with personal and possessive pronouns. In that case, Mr. Deep Six, you will be the subject of a sentence, which, like all sentences, expresses a complete thought. Your Honor, the sentence isn't ready yet. We ran out of verbs. Then this case will be continued sometime next week. The new pages using pronouns have just started coming off the presses, Mr. Fizzler. I hope they're not funny and foolish like the other ones. <laughs> Let me see some. Here's a new copy of the first page we looked at. I've marked the pronouns we're using and made an arrow to the noun they stand in place of. As the creature wagged its three tails, Vardok took off his cap and handed the princess her long-lost crown. Oh, that's much nicer. Look at this one. Angrily, the evil rustic growled, I think my plan has failed me. That's amazing. Three different pronouns to take the place of the word rustic. The meaning is correct, and it sounds so much better. Here's another, the way it was without pronouns. Gorf and Grista won the lottery. Gorf and Grista are buying a rocket. 
The rocket will soon be Gorf's and Grista's. And now, Gorf and Grista won the lottery. They are buying a rocket. It will soon be theirs. What a difference three pronouns make. You see why we needed pronouns? Yes, sir. The right pronoun in the right place makes a big difference. We're saved. Come on, far out. Get those presses rolling. You are on schedule. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Verbstar. At each of Verbstar's five stations, we celebrate the fact that English is now spoken and written throughout the galaxy. The verb is our theme, that most interesting of words. But even as we celebrate the verb with this wonderful Verbstar, let us also credit other words we use for communication. To make a sentence that tells a complete thought, we need not only a verb, but also a noun. But though we need and value the noun, this time our star, our word of the hour, is the verb. Now, to reveal all the intriguing intricacies of the verb, we bring you the fascinating world of Verb Star. <laughs> Station one. Here you will receive your first glimpse into the mysteries of the verb. The fascinating, aggravating verb. And why are verbs so special? Verbs change. Some words stay the same. Not verbs. Verbs change. Do you like to play? Play is a wonderful verb. There it is. Play. But play won't stay just play. You'll see play. You'll see playing and played. You see, it changes its endings. And a verb can change in other ways. Once in a while, for a special meaning, a verb insists on some helpers. You may see will play, has played, had played, or has been playing. You think play is mean and confusing? Not at all. Play is a regular verb. You can count on all regular verbs to change in the same way. But there are a few verbs that are really toughy. B. There's a wild one, the worst of the lot. Just look at what B does. Out of nowhere, it just freaks out with forms we never could expect. B. Am. Are. Is. Was. Were. Has been. These are all forms of B. Nothing regular about verbs like these. Irregular. Very irregular. But fascinating. Aggravating. What can you do with verbs like these? I'd surprise them. Memorize them. Verbs change. Okay. They know that now. As we move on, they'll find out how. Away with you to Station 2. Another mystery, eh, Watson? Quite right, Holmes. The mystery of the X form verbs. I've heard of that case. The verbs change, eh? And no one knows exactly why. Or who does it? That's it, Watson. That's it. It's who does it. I don't follow you. It's elementary, my dear Watson. A verb describes what happens, an action. And from time to time, the verb mysteriously changes. But the mystery is solved. The verb changes according to who did the action the verb describes. You may have something there. Of course. We can have the audience help us prove it, too. First, we list our suspects. Who can do the act? I can. Right. 
You, only you. Aha. Uh -huh. John can. Mary can. He can. She can. It can. Yes, yes, yes. We can. You can, all of you. They can. Yes, indeed. Each one of these is a very likely subject. Well said. We have identified all of those who might do the action the verb names. With which of these subjects do we find the S form? Perhaps if we test each subject with a verb, a verb like tell, we shall be able to solve the mystery of the S form. You're close to a solution, Holmes. Not a clue with we, not with a plural you, not they. No. We're drawing near. Aha. It's here. With he, with she and it. We see the change revealed. Here it is. We find the S. Bravo! Bravo! Here at Verb Star Station 2, we have brought you to the famous mystery of the S form verbs. A case in which the famous detective Holmes demonstrated that regular verbs take the S form when the subject is he, she, or it, or any single person or thing. We hope you enjoyed sharing the solution of the S form mystery. We'll move ahead now to Verb Star Station 3. I turn. It turns. You're right. You use the S. Look, it hasn't stopped. We need a form that means it turns, it turns, it turns, it turns. Since verbs can change their endings, how about turn with ing? Turning. It turning. It turning. That sounds Turning is pretty good. Maybe it just needs a helper. I know some words that would make perfect helpers. I am turning. You are turning. It is turning. Well, it was turning. You see, we needed a helper for I and D. Ladies and gentlemen, from this modest beginning, helping verbs came to have an important job working together with the main verb. Together, they are complete verbs with exact meaning. Tonight, here at Station 3 on Verb Star, we want you to meet these important helpers. Oh, yes. Some of them feel they should be called auxiliary verbs, but others are perfectly happy to be called helping verbs because, really, they help the main verb. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our important helpers seen at work as part of a complete verb. Am turning, is turning, are turning, was turning, were turning. You won't remember all their names this time, of course, but they will be very pleased if you recognize them when you see them. Has turned, have turned, had turned. Have been turning, has been turning, will have been turning. Will turn, can turn, must turn, might turn, would turn, should turn. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As we continue on to Station 5, remember that where you have action, you will have verbs and helping verbs. And here on Verb Star, you had a chance to meet them. becoming plain to see. What do I do? I talk. And you? You talk. John talks. He talks. Mary talks. She talks. Even it talks. Small change the S form. A different ending to agree with a particular subject. Another different ending. A change to I am talking gives a little different meaning to what is happening now. 
Suppose I want to tell you about something that has already happened. Another little ending change. Mm -hmm. E-D. And a verb gives a look at the past. Clever, these verbs. Just add E-D and you speak of the past. Now, how about the other way? Suppose we want to plan ahead. Not a change, mm -hmm. but a helper. And we can talk about the future. Verbs change. I used to think it was a bother. But verb changes let me talk in whichever direction I want. I found another way to use helpers. They help you talk now about something that has already happened. Now you look both ways. It's the end of the show. Look ahead again. It's time to go to the Star Station 5. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Verb Star Station 5. With us tonight is Dr. Ernest Verbose, verbologist, who will discuss current problems in verbal communication. Welcome, Dr. Verbose. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> Dr. Verbose, throughout the galaxy, we have had continuing reports of trouble with certain verbs. Mm, yes, yes. These troublesome verbs simply refuse to conform to normal standards of verb behavior. Doctor, are these simply bad verbs? How are we to deal with them? I have given this matter much thought. I will say this. There is no such thing as a bad verb. But doctor, with a regular verb, we know how it will change. The S form, ED for the past, the I, N, G. And they use the helpers. But don't we have a right to expect that all verbs should make the same changes? All of us would like that. Mm -hmm. Learning English would be easier. But many of these words had very unusual childhoods. They just grew the way they are. And they are stuck that way. Irregular. Oh, for example? Most irregular is B. <laughs> just look at this. All these are forms of B. Now, that is very irregular. That's almost freaky. Those may be freaky forms, but remember, there is no such thing as a bad verb. <laughs> these verbs are irregular, but they work. Hey, they do the job. B here is a very hard-working verb. <laughs> that is true. They do work. But now, uh, let's have a look at this machine you have invented to help deal with the irregular verb situation. How does it work? <clears throat> Very simply. You give the machine a word that you suspect has irregular forms. <clears throat> I give it now the word go. <coughs> Automatically, this wonderful <coughs> machine shows you the freaky forms. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. The irregular forms of the verb. Oh, amazing. Notice that here we have a slightly irregular form. An E must be added before the regular S. <laughs> Sue went. A totally irregular form. And Ray had gone. Gone is another irregular form of go. In this small screen, the machine gives right way, wrong way information. You can see, went is never used with a helper. <laughs> it's not Ray had went, it's Ray had gone. <laughs> Another irregular form of go. Oh, that's wonderful. Would anyone in the audience like to check a verb with the doctor's machine? Yes, sir, in the last row. Go. Very well. <laughs> and of course, it is irregular. We have the E added to the S form. Did for the simple past. And with the helping verb, it's had done. <clears throat> the screen shows you must have the helper. Never he done it, but he has done it. If you don't want to use a helper, just say, he did it. <clears throat> How about C? I think that's a good prospect. <clears throat> Yes, indeed. Here in the past, we have Sue saw, and with the helper, the form is seen. In the right-wrong screen, we 
ABC that seen has to have a helper. She has seen. Without the helper, say, she saw. Mm -hmm. uh, we're running a bit short of time, Doctor. Perhaps just one more. Hell. Good. The irregular forms of hell are has and had. And down here with the helper, we have an unusual thing. This verb is helping itself. <laughs> we are really getting quite short of time, Doctor. Just one more thing I want to point out. <laughs> For example, the verb give. Two irregular forms gave and given. The simple past and the form using the helper. These are the two places where most irregular verbs are irregular. Now, look at run. The simple past is ran, but like come, it is used with a helper in its basic form, run. John has run. As the screen shows, not has ran or had ran, but run. <clears throat> and now, as I seem to have used up my time, I, too, must run. <clears throat> change. Yes, sir, they're shifty. A verb is inclined to change at times to fit the subject or suit the time. A regular verb will change its end to S, E, D, or ing. It will work with a helper or even two to name the action you want it to. That is a regular verb. Irregular verbs are the other kind. They amaze the eyes and boggle the mind, but they do their work. They change in ways you don't expect. They change. Strange. Fascinating. Aggravating. They have no rule to learn about. So if they get you down and out... Just surprise them. Memorize them. The Verb Star Show will stand by for recycling if desired.